Hello, and welcome to From Shoeboxes to Clouds, Preserving Your Own Digital Archives. This is the virtual edition of the popular HMRC program, which we put together as a part of our participation in the Memory Lab Network. The Memory Lab Network is a group of public libraries dedicated to bringing digital preservation education and digital conversion opportunities to the public. We're grateful to our partners at the DC Public Library, as well as funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services for making this programming possible. I'll begin by introducing myself. My name is Matt Richardson, and I am the Photography Archive Supervisor at the Houston Metropolitan Research Center. I'm really glad you could join us today, and I'm looking forward to discussing some of the ways that thinking archivally can help you manage your own materials in this digital age. Before we jump into all the digital fun stuff, I think it's best if we take a step back and think about what exactly an archive is, what an archivist does, and how this relates to how you'll be working with your own materials. So as I mentioned, I am the Photography Archive Supervisor at the Houston Metropolitan Research Center, which is one of the special collections branches of the Houston Public Library. I am very fortunate in that I get to work with tremendous collections. We have over 4 million photographs in our collection. So what you see on the left side of this image is just one of those many photo collections. This is about how it looked when it came in the door. And when I think about explaining in very simple terms, one of the tasks an archivist performs, we take this picture on the left and we work to make it look like the picture on the right. We get materials and we select them in terms of what's historically important. We arrange them to find the original order or the order that makes the most sense for the users. We describe them, so we take whatever knowledge we have or can find of what they are and share that with our users, and we make it accessible. Typically, we would make it available in our reading room, but of course, we also try to get things digitized and posted online and accessible in whatever way is possible. So archivists select, arrange, describe, and make accessible materials. In the, case of the, in the case of the HMRC, we do this with materials specifically dedicated to the history of Houston. So what you see here shows the transition of the unprocessed materials into the ready to use, and actually in this case, soon to be digitized archival materials. Now, why am I talking about this in the context of your personal digital archives? Well, one way to think about the journey you're gonna be taking is that it's actually very similar as different as digital materials may seem, there's a lot we can learn from the work we do with physical materials. So we're gonna start right there. Now, of course, having said that, you still have to pose the question, what happens when your archive looks a lot less those physical boxes and a lot more like what you see here? You know, the title of this presentation comes from the idea that you might have a shoebox of pictures under your bed but now we have so many things living in the cloud, we've got to figure out how to manage it. But there's also all this intermediate stuff, right? It's not necessarily in your cloud storage. It's not necessarily in any real accessible place. It could be on a laptop or an iPad, which, okay, that works well enough for the moment, but we know those don't last forever. But it could also be on an old external hard drive that you haven't checked for a while to see if it's still working. It could be on old CDs, and maybe you don't have a CD player in your computer anymore. It could be on flash drives, but then it could be on all sorts of fun formats like these tapes you see. We have those audio compact cassettes. Maybe you have a VHS tape of a high school play. Maybe you're an artist who was producing materials on analog tapes or DAT tapes or other formats before things went to the more modern digital formats you're still wrestling with a lot of different formats. One of the goals of the Memory Lab, which we won't get into too much in this presentation, is to provide free public digitization services in a DIY setting. We're in the process of setting up a digital conversion station at the HMRC, which would facilitate transfer of VHS tapes, compact cassette tapes, and scanning of photos and slides. So stay tuned for more information about that. As I mentioned, there's actually a lot that's the same in tackling your digital archives when you think about your paper archives or other physical archives. So the good news is 
The advice on how to organize, appraise, and describe paper materials usually still applies to digital materials. This is good news for archivists as we wrestle with these materials in our collection, and it's good news for you as you think about your own materials. One piece of advice is to identify natural groupings or types of material. Archivists call these a series. When a collection is very large and has a lot of different types of materials in it, we try to find series that share commonalities to group these things together and make it easier to navigate. It could be that you put all the pictures in one place and all the videos in one place, or it could be that you put all the birthday parties together and all the graduations together and so on. It's also really important that you organize material in a way that's meaningful to you and understandable to someone else. It might make a lot of sense in your head when you come up with your system, but if somebody else can't walk up to it and decipher the organization of your archival materials, it's gonna be a lot less useful for them and a lot less likely that it's preserved for the long term. So if that's your goal, be sure you're thinking about who else might be looking at these materials when you start working. Some suggestions in those organizations could be to group things together by year, get all of 1994 together. You could do it by event where you want to put a family reunion in one place. Or you could, again, think about types of content, get all your video content into one you know, digital folder or other place, or get all of your pictures together and so on. Some of the systems we have on our computers and phones do this naturally for us in terms of formats, but some of the other stuff you'll have to really tackle yourself. Another suggestion is to start working with groups of material instead of getting bogged down looking at items. I know it's tons of fun once you start flipping through those old photos to reminisce about every one. And really that is the end goal of this work is to make it so that you can find those things you wanna look at and spend time with and enjoy. But at this stage, when you're first getting started, you wanna take a broad overview of the whole collection and think about what large groups sort of rise to the surface and how you can group those together to find manageable avenues of approaching this material. And finally, it's very important to assess your resources. It's important that you be realistic about how much time you have to dedicate to organizing your archives, what level of interest you have in it, who else might be interested, who else might help you, how much money you're gonna to have to spend. That's a real thing. And what outcomes are you looking for? There are lots of different ways to think about this. And my intention is to guide you not to the answers, but to the questions you need to be asking yourself since everyone's materials and everyone's resources and everyone's ideas are gonna be different. The art of clumping. We were very fortunate as HMRC archivists, as part of the Memory Lab Network, to travel to Washington, D.C. and learn from archivists and digital preservation experts at the Library of Congress, the D.C. Public Library, and several other partners. In one of the presentations they provided for us, one of the archivists used this term, the art of clumping, and it stuck with me. It's really a nice, sort of neat, low-tech, um, accessible way of just thinking, okay, what stuff goes together? Sometimes it's as simple as that. Get all your family photos over here, get all of your work documents over here, get all of your legal files over here. Maybe you just arrange things like this in this sort of topical way. So you could think about, okay, I want my family photos to all be together so my children can enjoy them later. I need all my work documents together for very practical reasons, but realistically, I don't expect these to be maintained you know, beyond my lifetime. Or maybe you do if you're depending on the nature of your work. And then you might have something like your legal files. And I realize this isn't necessarily what people think of. We all want to go straight to those great, fun family photos when we think of our personal digital archives. But in the world we live in, there are so many important files that have gone digital. We also do need to think about organizing these types of things. So creating this sort of series organization based on topics or functions is a really good way to clump your stuff together in a way that'll make it very apparent to you where, what you're looking for, or very apparent to someone else who comes along if those are the types of things they're interested in. Another approach to creating series in your personal archives is to think about things in terms of format. It could be that you put all your photos into one place, all your videos in one place, all your documents into one place, and so on. There are advantages and disadvantages to either type of approach, but either one is a sound archival practice in terms of organizing your materials in a way that you have a starting point, you have 
ready access and you have a comp comprehensible system that somebody else could walk up to and understand. Okay, and we've talked a lot about what's similar, but of course, yes, we all know there are important differences when you're dealing with digital files. There are a lot of new problems, a lot of new challenges, and a lot of new things to think about. This is where you get really into assessing what your resources are, what your skills are, what your goals are. So at this point, I'm just going to outline some of the differences. And then as we jump into the second portion of this program, we'll begin to think more about your own collections and the questions you'll need to ask yourself. So what are some of those differences? One of the major ones would be media and file format obsolescence. That's a big way of saying sometimes things stop working. So it could be that you have material on an old floppy disk. Maybe you don't have a player for that anymore. That would be an example of media obsolescence. Maybe you have something in an old WordPerfect file, but your current word processor can't read that file and cannot render the words that you wrote so beautifully 20 years ago. That would be file format obsolescence. So there are a lot of different ways this can appear, and there's a varied range, but none of them are very helpful. So some of the things to look out for are, you could have the inability to access content at all. If you just flat out do not have a VHS player, it's really hard to access that content, even though you've got a perfectly good condition tape you know, stored somewhere in your house. It could be that you're able to access files to copy them, but not open them. This will happen a lot on older digital media like floppy disks, where you might be able to actually open it up on a machine if you have a reader, see that it's there, maybe even back it up to the cloud or something like that, but you don't have any software or the appropriate technical stuff working in the background to open the file and interact with it meaningfully. So it's so close, but yet so far. Another possibility in this category is that you could open the files but not render the files correctly. I think a lot of people have seen this where you open up an old word processed file and all of a sudden it's wingdings everywhere and all sorts of crazy formatting and crazy spacing. And you think, oh, but that's, it's there, but it doesn't look right. So that's another possibility that could happen. And all these reasons are why we're gonna talk later about the importance of choosing good file formats. Another consideration is that digital files are susceptible to corruption and alteration, both of the actual content and of the metadata, which is a fancy word for the description. It could be that the bits in the digital file have rotted. You know, it's all ones and zeros. Every now and then, one of those zeros decides it wants to be a one, and then everything is ruined, more or less. Another problem, which is probably more familiar, especially in the age of cloud backups and phone devices and everything else, is the scale of the amount of stuff we're creating. I don't know how many thousands of pictures I have of my two-year-old daughter, but it's a lot. And I know some are duplicates. I know, you know that I've backed things up here and then backed them up there. There are duplicates all over the place. So you have to manage things on a scale that you simply did not when you put a roll of film in a camera and pay to develop 24 pictures the next day. Finally, or not finally, there's a couple more. There are complex interrelated files and web-based content. This may or may not be a concern for you, but sometimes you're not just looking at a single file, but a whole set of files. Like if you're trying to save an entire website which has pictures and text and other things on it. And then finally, because this is plenty of stuff to worry about, there's just this intangible nature of digital content. There's the fact that you can't put your finger on it in the same way, and it just makes it a little bit harder to wrap your head around. That can make it really intimidating to get started. And that's why in the next portion of this program, we're gonna start about some good starting, talk about some good starting points and how you can think about beginning your own project in organizing your personal digital archives. Please join us.